Hey, welcome to the 154th episode of Just Shoot It, a podcast about filmmaking, screenwriting, and directing. This episode is brought to you by patron Hart Perez. I'm Matt Enloe. And I'm Oren Kaplan, and today we have Kathleen Grace on the show. She is the CEO of New Form, a digital studio that Matt and I have both worked with. Uh, Matt did his Lisa Kudrow show for Refinery29 with them. That's right. And I did Miss 2059 for them. We go way back. We've got a lot of friends over at New Form, and Kathleen is, uh, you know, kind of leading the charge over there uh, with innovating new and interesting content but she's got an incredible history of coming up in digital media and it's interesting to learn how her history at the forefront of this new media has really helped inform the way that she develops and runs a company yeah i mean she's kind of like a media genius we delve into like the entire story of like what made her who she is today and even though it's like a lot of like how did you get there that we talk about i think it's all really fascinating and super relevant to today i think people will pick out a lot of really cool tips and i think the the main lesson the thing that kathleen embodies and like continues to teach us over and over again is that in circumstances where things feel uncertain or things are changing or new there's opportunity and she's living proof that that continues to be the case and she's managed to seize those opportunities over and over again so there's plenty to learn from kathleen there's so much in fact that i think we're gonna forego our catch up one more time but we'll learn all about what Orin and I are doing next week, but we do have an iTunes review. B-Man1205 says, great pod, five stars, wonderful guests, and useful info. Hey, thanks, B-Man. If you want to help the show grow, if you want to support the community for free, be like B-Man, hop onto iTunes and drop us a review. It, it is the number one way that you can help the show grow and build the community even more. And if you want to support the show not for free... Check out our Patreon page, patreon.com slash just shoot a pod. Uh, you can give a dollar, two dollars, four dollars, twenty dollars per month. We have a few of those. It's pretty cool. We just use that money to pay our editor and to do live shows and to get better equipment and do all the things that help keep this podcast alive. I have to bribe my wife now to let us record at home <laughs> every night. Your continued support helps bring in guests like Kathleen and Carrie and David and, you know, uh, program out special slates like our development four-part series. And also there are live events and more series just like this. So we really appreciate it. Patreon.com slash Just Shoot a Pod. Throw a couple bucks into the bucket. Helps everything. Thanks, everyone. And thanks for listening. And keep writing us. Uh, we just got an email from someone saying like, hey, you said you don't know who your listeners are. And uh, it's helpful. So do it. Yeah. And also, um, you know, Orin and I work hard on the show. We just spend a decent amount of time on it. And it's genuinely nice to hear that you listen. So thanks, everyone. With that, let's just get to our guest, Kathleen Grace. Hello, Kathleen Grace. So usually we don't kind of do break-in stories, but we, we were wondering what yours is in a nutshell. I originally, out of college, moved to New York to work in off-Broadway theater. And I was working in a ticketing box office. Wait, did you go to film school? No, I went to undergrad. My parents would never have let me do that. Um, smart, <laughs> smart. <laughs> no, I got a liberal arts education. It was not, that didn't yeah, meaningfully equally, actually yeah, yeah. be that. <laughs> like, it's not like I decided then to be a doctor. Um, I went to McGill in Montreal, oh, cool. which was awesome. That was actually a great thing they made me do. You know, I wanted to do it, but the great thing my dad suggested and ended up being amazing. But are you Canadian? No, okay. I'm from Texas. I just wanted to get out of Texas mm -hmm. badly. And cool. Montreal was cool. An 18-year-old drinking age in French. And very different from Texas. And very different from Texas. Yeah. Um, so I graduated. I moved to New York to work in off-Broadway theater. I was like directing off, off, off-Broadway, like at a little theater company. And I was like, working in this ticketing box office. And I'd been in New York for maybe like three, four years. When I, I suddenly realized like, oh... I don't know if I actually want to direct theater because I will one have to wait for an old white man to die. And then even if he does, I don't want to direct Broadway musicals. Mm -hmm. So it's like, what am I doing? Right. Like <laughs> that's the big time. That's the goal. The right? goal. I don't yeah. even want the goal. Right. And so I realized I really liked working with actors, writing, and that collaboration process. And I was like, oh well, I could do that and not do theater. Like I could do TV or film. And at the same time, I had this soul-sucking box office job uh, where I literally worked in a bank vault 
like this off-Broadway theater in New York has a bank vault as the ticket office window. Mm -hmm. It's like no light of day Mm -hmm. in front of computers all day selling tickets to Upper East Side rich people. Do you get to like swim in the gold coins? I wish there were no gold coins. (laughs) Wait, wait. So this isn't like, I I heard like the version of the story where I was thinking like, oh, you're in like a cute like Brooklyn small theater. No, it was like 43rd and 8th. You're like at like TKTS or something like that. It was second stage theater, which is like a nonprofit uh, off-Broadway theater that now actually has a Broadway house. And it's cool. Like I got to see really cool plays and worked with nice people, but it was soul sucking. This was right when the internet started to be like a thing. I mean, mm-hmm. when the internet existed, it started becoming right. like people had Al Gore Gmail. had just invented no. it. <laughs> and like you, had, you would have internet at work. You know, mm-hmm. you would already have the internet, but you would have like hours of sitting and like surfing the internet. Like people didn't surf the internet before. They would just like hang out in AOL right. chat they, rooms. They'd check their mail. Yeah. And this and was, was like 2005-ish. This is the dawn of web series basically yeah, yeah. and like they they did not exist at this point youtube did not exist at this point just to set the stage and i started watching a lot of weird videos on this website channel 101 mm-hmm. with my co- co-workers what was I, your series what did you like uh, well the first thing i can i distinctly remember watching is house of cosby's yeah yeah. Which was amazing. And everyone should immediately Google House of Cosby's and shit themselves laughing. And New York, so funny. they do Channel 102. And there was this kid doing Channel 102 who was friends with this girl, Becky Yamamoto. I don't even remember the guy's name. I just remember emailing Becky and being like, Becky, who's this guy? Who does Channel 102? <laughs> I, I need to know more about this. And um, I was working with this guy, JJ Shabesta, who was like the one who introduced me to all. And he's now like a director, worked for The Onion for a while, or whatever. And... I looked at this guy's website and I had recently built a website for my own theater company. And I was like, not really knowing who Dan Harmon was or any mm-hmm, of the context. Mm-hmm. I was like, fuck that guy. I can build a website. I don't need him. To- and just for our listeners, Dan Harmon created Channel 101 and the yeah. community. And, yeah. Uh, I did not know that he was. Like, right, and at this right. point, he well, wasn't really he like wasn't, a famous no, no, he TV wasn't writer. Famous yeah, yeah. Until yeah. And like pretty much. the Lonely Island guys weren't the Lonely Island guys. Like they were kind of there. I was yeah. like all in the... The soup. Did you know the Waverly Flams guys? Maybe yes. Waverly Films guys? They yeah, were yeah. like kind of early on then too, making just like cool really videos. Cool videos. Yeah, yeah. 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 You would watch, basically, if, if you could watch a sketch group's quick time videos, that's your early, like your pre yeah. YouTube, yeah. basically. Well, yeah. they were doing like 48 hour film festivals and then putting their stuff on the internet. On the internet. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. I started following those guys and I was like, well, I don't need someone else's permission to build a website. Mm-hmm. I know how to build a website. Not really thinking through that. I did not know how to do video encoding or hosting or any of this shit. I was like, okay. And at the time, I had lived in Williamsburg and then couldn't afford to live in Williamsburg and was living in Harlem and was very, like, bitter about Williamsburg hipsters. And so I was like, we should make a sitcom about the gentrification of Williamsburg. And at the time, also, the, like, always sunny thing had happened. Mm -hmm. Like, the guys had, like, self-funded their own pilot. And so... I approached my friend Tom Woodley through a friend of mine because, one, I knew that he was, like, a writer, but he also had a car. Mm-hmm. And I was Which like... in New York is, like, a, a big, big deal. deal. Sure. Yeah. And I had come up with, like, kind of loosely what the characters were and generally what we would do. And the idea was, like, oh, we'll just, like, shoot a pilot. And in the parallel to this, I started... I left my box office job and started working in independent film, like, PA and stuff. And because uh, I was like, I'm going to do this film thing and TV thing. And so I told him and he was like, well, my friend Matt should work on it. And the three of us started developing it and writing it. Um, it ultimately became called The Berg. And it was a satire of Williamsburg hipsters. And we were mid and Tom was very smart and was like, well, if we're going to shoot one episode because he had done some AD work, he was like, let's block shoot and shoot a bunch. So we borrowed basically $5,000 from my parents and I was, I had borrowed money for them when I started my own theater company and managed to like pay them back. And so I was like, oh, nice. I was like, yeah. Yeah. this is a sure bet, mom and dad. <laughs> yeah. Like, I can pay you back. Right. Um, and so we filmed, we wrote, mo- and mostly Tom and Matt, and I was like kind of producing and directing it. They wrote three episodes, each around 15 minutes. I don't know why we decided that. It was like mm-hmm. a completely arbitrary choice. I think Tom was like, yeah, well, let's make them 15 minutes and show them that we can make more than one episode. Sure. Right. Which is yeah. dumb because we should have just done a fucking 22, whatever. Yeah. Like, in retrospect, <laughs> I was like, why? Well, we even though that? now today, I feel like that would have been smart. 15 minute is like, it's fine. It's fine. Exactly. <laughs> 
And we block shot the three episodes. And in the midst of editing the three episodes, and this is like, it took us forever, like, to mm-hmm. do all this. Sure. Um, right. You're cutting and the film, splicing <laughs> it together. Well, we shot on Panasonic DVX 100s, like these yeah. sh- mm-hmm. mini DVDs. 24P. 24P. And, and we cast all these people, like, from um, our friends and kind of the UCB world. Um, this guy Mike Still is in the pilot. This guy Joe Randazzo is in the pilot. I think they were in our first episode. We ended up casting this woman, Kelly Yiddish, who at the time was in All My Children and is now on Law and Order Special Victims Unit. But she just wanted, like, that was my big revelation through that process was, like, please cast soap actors because they are really good at hitting their marks and they sure. want to do anything but the soap kind right. of stuff. So, like, she right. was And they can fun. glance at their pages and be ready to go. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. If you give them a second take, they're like, yeah, so they're And they have a built-in fan base. Right. Interesting. Okay. Yes. And then we also Some built grandmas. this whole mechanic. I was like, every episode will be scored by a local indie Brooklyn band. Those two details are kind of important later on. And so all of this is like on the weekends. And my friend Anna is like editing it while she secretly on the final cut system of this independent film she was mm-hmm. making with Willem Dafoe. Like, and I'm like, <laughs> I'm working on another independent film. And we're, and this is all happening. And then YouTube becomes a thing. Like it started, it had launched in 2005, but like no one really knew about it till 2006. And we're in the middle of editing it, and I'm like, "Oh, there's this YouTube thing." But our episodes, I was like, "Maybe we should just put our stuff on the internet, and like maybe we should put it on YouTube, but it's too long for YouTube. So let's make six shorts that can go on YouTube that can drive traffic to this website I'm gonna buy or build." And so right. May 24th, 2006. We uploaded our first short with the idea that we post one short a week on YouTube for six mm-hmm. weeks leading up to the launch of our website. Like, <laughs> like Ooh. anyone fucking cared. <laughs> like, but this is my whole like cockamamie sure. scheme. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but this, this is in the days when like 500 views is like a jackpot. Yeah, right? totally. E- even you saying driving traffic like brought back memories. Yeah, you like, know, like. And so May 24, 2006, we put this what is 45 second short called "Hip or Dangerous" on YouTube. And literally six weeks later, I'm in the New York Times. Six months later, we're in Wired mm-hmm. magazine. Like, there's a New York magazine article. It's like, who are these fucking kids? And they're making a sitcom in their spare time. And I was insane. I have a distinct memory of like, we all made these episodes. No, everyone worked for free. And I was like, I remember we like all got together one for Thursday night or something. And I was like, you know what the fucking trick is, guys? We just keep doing it. We don't stop. <laughs> like a mad person. Like I'm like, what? In retrospect, yeah. I'm like, who yeah. did I think I was? Yeah, yeah. Do you think you were Logan Paul or something? <laughs> <laughs> so then we did that. And basically, flash forward. And this is all like I had. Like, we were crazy. Like, Tom was working at an ad agency. I was working on, at a certain point during this whole process, I worked on The Wrestler. I worked for Darren Aronofsky. Like, crazy. I was working. yeah, yeah. Like, I worked on you're TV like, shows. you're like, that guy's not paying anybody. I can too. <laughs> <laughs> um, Is he known for not paying? The the, oh. the Black Swan uh, internship yeah. lawsuit. Was oh, like right. That and then, it. so, uh, we're all working crazy hours. And then eventually around, I think we launched in 2006, midway through 2007, I get this cold email from Michael Eisner. <laughs> Like, right. Who was the CEO of Disney at the time? Uh, he had left. Oh. He had already right. started Bukaru, but oh. he was still okay. like a name brand. Yeah. It, right, right. Like, he hosted the to... wide world of Disney for yeah, exactly. our, right, childhood. Right. But I guess right. our, our younger listeners might not know who he is at oh, all Oh, yeah, you're today. right. People would Yeah. Not. Or even what the wild, wide world of Disney is. <laughs> he actually. has it a Sunday right. movie night where they show Disney movies. Right. Yeah, but he was also, also the CEO of Disney. <laughs> which is, but also when you think about that, like, how ridiculous is that? He's the CEO of the so company. Funny. He's like, guys, I have an idea. <laughs> oh, he hosted it while he was the no, CEO? No, no, but yeah. that's because of uh, Walt would host that show. Oh, I didn't realize yeah, that. And it was like, oh, it was like the Disney vault. It was like you couldn't yeah. watch those movies or shorts or anything. And so I get this cold email and I'm like, uh this is crazy. And I like text Wait, what does it say? (laughs) And no, it's like, I want to meet with you. I love your work. Okay. I'm like, wow. Okay. So I, you're like, there's probably a lot of Michael Eisner's out there. (laughs) (laughs) And I email Tom and Tom and I are like, what do we want to do? And I literally go to the call sheet of the movie I'm working on the time. And I look up the lawyer and I call cold call her. And I'm like, you don't know me. I've delivered paperwork to your office. 
But I just got an email from Michael Eisner, and I think I need a lawyer before I go into that meeting. <laughs> Why? I did not know this part. This is incredible. That's pretty yeah. smart. And yeah. she is to this day a very good friend and my entertainment lawyer. Awesome. awesome. And by the way, that's like a pretty hot tip that we've never heard on the yeah, show before. Yeah, good takeaway. Episode yeah. 154. Uh, like if you need someone a lawyer in a pinch, that might yeah. be on a call sheet, look at a call sheet. And oh, I, <laughs> my biggest recommendation to anyone breaking into production, and even if you want to be on the creative track, work at, one, at least one job as an office PA mm-hmm. because I literally... I don't know if this is okay, but stole all the contracts from oh, that sure. gig. Yeah, oh, yeah. contracts. I thought you were going to say contacts. <laughs> and contacts. Like, I would just save every contact sheet, every yeah. call sheet. I would save every contract. I used every... And then what? And, you blackmail the actors? No, I'd, like, white out the <laughs> legal entities and mm. make them my own legal entity so that I didn't have to pay a lawyer to draft production contracts. Right. Oh, right. Because cool. it's when you're pretty boilerplate. Yeah. yeah. Like, and you just are like, oh, okay, yeah. I can use this and, and read everything. That were those weird smudges on my new form contracts. <laughs> <Yeah>. Exactly. <laughs> to this day. Yes. Um, it's like Oren Aronofsky. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Sure. Great. Um, so I, we go to this meeting. It's very strange. It's, he has an apartment. You meet him in per- person. In person. He has an apartment at, um, what hotel is that on the upper, near the Central Park on like the Upper East Side? I'm not going to remember, but it has like the whole floor. Like, right. Yeah. And you walk in and it's like, you turn and there's like a ridiculously expensive piece of artwork on the wall. Mm-hmm. Right, Picasso. <laughs> and Picasso's Rembrandt. there like something fi- finishing like that. it up. It was something like name brand. Favorite. And also right. like a, a Mickey Mouse. <laughs> <laughs> so Tom and I sit down, yeah. Michael sits down and he's like, Whatever you want to do next, I'll fund. And I'm like, huh? And we had kind of been like, we should have some pitches ready. Sure, sure. And so we were like, oh, well, we kind of make the, want to make this mockumentary about an indie rock band. And the reason we pitched this was like, I knew that Michael Eisner had made the monkeys. Mm-hmm. And I was like, he'll probably like something that's like yeah, the yeah. monkeys that reminds him of when he was a young executive at ABC because he Greenlit he Green and produced The Monkees. Right, which was a show about a band. About a band. And also, it was right when MySpace was huge. And so we were like, mm. and we can distribute it on MySpace. Right, and right, he had right. just made right. this deal with the show Prom Queen mm-hmm. and just did a distribution deal with MySpace right. on it. And we were like, this he is was like, perfectly keyed to his strategy. He was buddies with Tom, probably. Yeah. And he was like, I love it. Let's do it. And I was like, oh. Cool. You're like, would you do it for like ten thousand? <laughs> <laughs> Basically, I was like, so you're gonna give us money? Yeah. Um, and then we spent about the next. I will be honest. It took like eight months to negotiate that deal. Sure. And like, which is not unheard of. Yeah, exactly. I didn't know that at the time. I was like, this is yeah. so torturous. Yeah, and the whole time we're like still making the burg, and he wants to buy the burg outright from us. And I'm like, mm, I don't feel great about that. And mm-hmm. did this lawyer come with you or help you? In that first meeting, no, but she negotiated the whole deal. Everything. Oh, cool, cool. Yeah, now you're like, oh, I've got a deal on the table with Michael Eisner. Yeah, like, and, and also yeah. because of this, we like met with CAA, we met with WME, we did all the agent meetings, and there's really funny stories about that. We're like, because digital was like hot. Sure. We yeah. were like hot for a moment. This all happens. We end up making the show The All For Nots. Mm-hmm. It is a mockumentary about an indie rock band. We record an album, and we make basically 300 minutes of content, a full-length album, 12, and we cast and create this band for... Five hundred thousand dollars, and it, for me at twenty seven, you think that's the most money ever? It's I an mean, insane amount of money. In it's fairness, it probably was the most amount of money a digital show got at that time. For sure, yeah, yeah probably. We I mean, it's still a ton of money. Basically, two and a half feature films and a full length album for five hundred thousand dollars, <laughs> yeah. and like controlled all the rights, yeah. like super aggressive. Like our contracts for those actors were like. Um, because of what Eisner wanted, they were like uh, American Idol contracts. It, they were so aggressive. It yeah. was like, we are going to pay you 150 bucks a day. Sure. We're going to put you in this band. And if one song is a hit, we own you for life. Right. Like, it was <laughs> yes. really yeah, aggressive. Like- <laughs> Wait, so you cast the band. They didn't know each other. It wasn't a real band. No, it was a totally you put cast it together. band. We like put a, it together. Simon Cowell did. Uh, kind, yeah. Do, uh, you, do you recall how you came up with the number 500,000? Like, like why we had like budgeted our own shoots and like I knew from the Berg in the midst of this, uh, we got a deal from Motorola to do nine shorts. Mm -hmm. And so we finally had budget. So I Mm -hmm. negotiated a SAG new media deal before there was a SAG new media deal with East Coast SAG. And so I knew roughly how fringes worked Uh and like 
all of that. Tom had done enough Aideen and like right. his you own just stuff. Kind of piecemeal together. In retrospect, it was not enough money. Sure. I mean, like I made no money, and in making that show, ultimately between that and the Berg went twenty five thousand dollars in personal credit card debt. Right. Right. Of like, course. But, but also, you're like mom and dad. Like the New York Times just wrote about me. Totally. So they kind of got it, but they were like, maybe you could just get a job. Right, right. Because <laughs> like, I kept like doing production and then I would like, I worked for Darren for maybe nine months mm-hmm. and I left because I was like, I have to go do my yeah. second half of my shoot for my thing for Eisner. Right. And he was like, good luck. <laughs> and then, so I made this show that was all exciting and really cool. What was that show called? The All for Nots. Oh, right. The All for Nots. So, and we like continued making episodes of The Berg along the way. Mm-hmm. And then 2008 happened. The crash. I got dropped from CA and they like never told me. They well, never told us. well, your rep left and then. And they just never managed to like that was just, that communicate was that. it. Yeah, yeah. Which also is not unheard of. No. Right? But at the time I was like it's a no, super it's, emo about it. I no, was like, look, obviously. what's sure. going to happen to me? Yeah, yeah. You know, because they convince you that they are the key But let me ask you, everything. you were like, Michael Eisner is like, personally emailing you you're going to his apartment you're he's t- telling you he'll fund anything you want you're written up in the new york times Do, did caa do anything for you that you couldn't have done on your own in the midst of all of this between the berg and the motorola deal and uh, the all for nots tom and i made a deal with this company called video egg that doesn't exist anymore and I don't know what they were. They were like a video distribution system and they set up brand deals. Like it now all seems very not like a business, but (laughs) then at the same time, elements of it are businesses that exist today in other names. So you're like, they were on to something. They were just way too early. Yeah. But but branding, like maybe it was there like a shopping element as well. Like maybe you could like, (laughs) yeah, they, the character wears the jacket in the series and you can buy that. Maybe something like that. that. Yeah. And, we made a deal with them to do another series. I can't even remember what it was. Oh, it was a, a thriller mystery set in a college campus. And CAA knew that Video Egg was working with a brand on it. Mm-hmm. And, th- and this is by far the most, I use this as an example of like what you want your agency to do and why it is good to have a kind of bigger agency potentially. They knew that Sprint, who was the brand, was going to fire their agency because they were repping Sprint as a retainer client. CAA was. Yeah. Which is like, who knew they do that? They still right. do that to this day. And so they had like inside information. They didn't tell us this inform- inside information. So they didn't like uh, violate any sure. non-disclosure agreements. But they heavily negotiated for our deal to be pay or play. Mm. Which in the world of brand entertainment is like bonkers that they yeah. pulled that off. Yeah. But they were like, you got to give these guys pay or play. They got a lot of shit going on. And if you can't make this happen, Video Egg, like, you better pay them out. And for our listeners, pay or play, if you don't know, it means that you signed a deal. And even if you never end up making whatever. You get paid your full amount. Or sometimes. And they can be like a 50% too. Yeah. And you basically 10 days before you just go shoot this thing, Sprint fired their agency and pulled the project. But Video Egg had agreed to this pay or play agreement. Right. So and you so, bankrupted Video Egg. <laughs> no. We then spent like three months negotiating it, and I think we got like half of it. But it was super meaningful. It let us open an office. Mm-hmm. It let us like, it gave us the runway to allow us to do all this stuff. And so like, that was huge. Like yeah. CAA like paid for themselves there. Right. And also they for they gave up their commission on the all for nuts because we uh, had brought it in before we signed with them. Gotcha. But and did they, they bring you the new egg, the video egg deal? No, or? they didn't. They didn't bring us any of the deals. So they, they negotiated. Negotiate. Okay. Yeah. And that was helpful. And right. like, I think anyone who expects their agent to get them work is dumb. Right. Well, that, <laughs> like, that that's the thing. Like, disappointed maybe. <laughs> like, well, I know we, we bring yeah. that up on the show a lot, but I just think it's like, you can't, um, say it enough because we have so many people write to us and they're like, yeah, I'm trying to get an agent. I'm trying to get a manager. I'm trying to get this. You know, I feel like I'm ready for the next level. Um, you know, it's one thing if they're like, I have this deal and I want someone to negotiate right. it. And it's another thing if they're like, I just feel like I'm ready for more work, you know, so I need an agent. They and, won't do that for yeah, you. Yeah. And so it's like just the example of like, like one of the top 
digital creators in the world at this point, and CAA still is not, and we're, we're and the also best agency in the world. One of the first, right? Like the players at this point are, v- it's very few people who are in this marketplace yet. Yeah, it's like me, uh, the Rocket Boom guys. Sure. Yeah. And uh, the Duder guys, Matt Kirsch. Yeah. So Duder, the Berg. There's all the people uh, that's super deluxe. Four Eyed yeah. Monsters. Remember that? Mm-mm, it was no. like this semi not scripted but it was like a semi autobiographical drama about this mm-hmm. couple making a movie about their relationship so it was like not scripted but felt scripted mm-hmm. it was super fucking crazy and really weird and they were like it was weird you're like this is weird but i was addicted to it i was like uh, i want to watch this couple in, like incinerate themselves by making a movie together it was so amazing <laughs> well and also there's like that electric feeling of like oh we're on the brink of something new no and you it know? definitely like felt that way yeah. um and but there was also at the same time all these companies saying like we don't trust these people like why would we spend money i remember i was pitching like digital videos we had I'm good friends with a guy that made this video called shoes oh yeah Kel- shoes. Kelly shoes Love. yeah, yeah. So we took him to uh, K-Swiss and we're like, hey, look at this video. It's got, it's like the numbers to most viewed video on YouTube. Um, we'll make a video. We'll do shoes with, for K-Swiss. Let's do it. And then the CFO of K-Swiss is like, uh, I could put a commercial on during the Lakers game and see like, you know, have it be seen by like 20 million people. Like, why would I put a commercial on YouTube? Yeah, that yeah. was weird. Then also I had weird conversations when we did the Motorola sponsorship with Berg, with the Berg where they're like... It was like almost done and video egg had mm-hmm. set it up. And at the one yard line, video egg was like, I was working at this point. I was like someone's assistant. They called me in the middle of the day and they were like, you need to get on the phone with the creative director of the agency. Like, if you don't do this. The deal doesn't go through. <laughs> and I was like, bah! and I like told my boss, I was like, I'm really sorry. I gotta do this. And I get on the phone and the direct, the creative director guy's like, how do you do it? <laughs> I was like, what? And he was like, how do you do it? I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, make it look so good for so little money. Sure. I mean, it's a magic trick, right? Like, it, some of it is like yeah, well, generation, right? Well, <laughs> I was like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, my <laughs> smug, shitty 27 year old bitchy Kathleen answer was like, well, I don't have a house. I'm fucking Greenwich. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, but, but true. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and I think that. It's also like, look, technology lined up perfectly with like your ambitions and there is also, you know, a, a bit of a handicap with like, like, oh, this is the right way to do things, right? You know, yeah. like the, this preconceived idea of like what it means to do it right and what good means and what it takes to do something that looks good or professional or whatever. And like we didn't know what that was necessarily. Yeah, you know? I knew just enough to make the people working on the Berg or whatever feel like, oh, this is a real thing. Mm-hmm. Right. Like I knew just enough to be dangerous. Right. And then I knew... But you were also young and everyone you were working yeah, with was young. young. And so it's like, like, you don't we need were having to make... Fun too. You're not worried about yeah mortgages or yeah preschools or whatever. Yeah. And then I knew... Like, I didn't know enough so that I would do things the broken way. Mm -hmm. Like, I remember showing um, one of my bosses at the time, like, a call sheet and how we shot the Berg and how it was, we shot it as a three-camera shoot. Mm -hmm. There'd always be two cameras and a rolling camera that, like, either Tom or I would take or I would boom. And, like, I also showed her how many pages we shot and how we didn't get location permits and how we run and gun the whole thing. Right, Right. And she was like... You do 18 pages in a day. That is a lot of pages. And I was like, and she's like, can you do a three camera version of this? I was like, well, that was like an insane day and it was all available light. And like, right. like none of this was locations. It was all, there was this episode training day where we wrote, had the characters ride from Brooklyn to Queens because the, the G train was down and they needed to get whatever. But like, so that was like a day when we were like, we need to shoot out this episode in basically two days. And we had to do, I think we did like 15 pages, something insane. But I didn't know that that was crazy. Right, right. Like, I was like, oh, well, yeah. Like, if you write the story the right way and you get everyone bought into it Mm -hmm. and you really restrict how many characters there are and how many locations, like, she just couldn't understand that, like, I could do that. I was Mm -hmm. like, well, I 
we all work together to make it so that we can accomplish it in the time that we can and with the resources that we have. And everyone's on board with that. Right. And right. that kind of blew her mind as a traditional television person. She was like, how do you get people to do that? I'm like, uh, you ask them. Right. <laughs> like, <laughs> and you say please and thank you and you let them have creative way in. Right. Like you don't make everyone just a cog in the wheel. You just say, what's your opinion, sound guy? Right. Like, do you think we should do it this way or like? Yeah. yeah. But you also have a network of people that you're working with. That right? w- are that, willing to do it. Yeah, yeah. That you know. And also, you know, we'd make jokes about getting paid and exposure. But like back then it was a actual lot. Exposure. Actual exposure. And like the metrics that you were looking at were blowing people's minds. Right. Like now, yeah. like getting thousands of views on something, you know, is so much more commonplace. Back then, like it's just. You, you couldn't wrap your head around it. There yeah, were only like point, a few thousand people watching videos. At one point we were getting hundreds of thousands and millions of views on our website. Right. On like, your website. Not YouTube. On our website. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And that's what a lot of the debt was, was the hosting costs. Oh, right. Because oh, really? that's when yeah, you had to sure. pay for your bandwidth, right? <laughs> not smart on my part. Yeah. Um, though, although in retrospect, I'm like, half a million views, who cares? That's right. the crazy thing right. about YouTube now. Like uh, at New Form, we had this tech story thing, and we crossed a, something like a billion views after like four months or something. Yeah, yeah. And we like made a big stink about it internally, and then we tried to make a big stink about it externally. We were like, a billion views. And people were like, shrug. Yeah. Yeah. And you're like, a billion views is a lot of views. Come on, guys. No, but I think shrugging is a good thing. So, yeah. <laughs> Ask the kids. It's like a, <laughs> it's like a cool, <laughs> move, cool move, dance yeah. move. Um, so, okay. <laughs> So, oh, yeah. so the bo- economy bombed out and uh, I no more agent. No one was buying digital content. And I kept trying to pitch TV shows. Um, mm-hmm. Like to network, network traditional. To traditional. And it wasn't working for me creatively. Uh, they also still, I mean, there's still a little bit of stigma on digital. But like back then, oh, yeah, they, it was like a preschooler was walking in to yeah. be like, oh, like I, trust me, I know how to make TV shows. Yeah. They don't care. Yeah. Well, and also I kept doing what ultimately I think ends up serving me in the long run is that like I kept going in and being like, here's the show. Here's the entire marketing plan. This is the future. Mm-hmm. Like I over like mm-hmm. I tried to change their whole business model. Right. While also pitching right. them a TV show instead of just. You pitch them the creative the t- and the business. Yeah. And that, just the creative. Instead of just the creative and that. uh ultimately i think threatened them i don't know or they, they were like who's this crazy person and why is she just telling me about the show why is she telling me how we should market it and make money on it <laughs> right. like, um, um, this is totally out of sequence but i'm curious if at new form what your response is to people pitching you like creative marketing, and business a, a like a marketing plan, plan. Yeah. like are you into that or are you like let us worry about that uh, i mean if the person's really into it like yeah let's talk you might have better ideas than me mm-hmm. i don't want to spend most of the meeting on that and i think this is my lesson from like young kathleen is because like if you're spending a ton of meeting talking about the marketing you may have not have spent enough time thinking about the story mm-hmm. and like i think sometimes it's fun to think about all the marketing and you miss like this character makes no sense mm-hmm. or like you don't know the answer to fundamental things or there's no tension in the third act if you're so obsessed with how it's marketed you may not have spent enough time on the story and maybe you're just a marketer yeah right? That too. Which is an okay thing to be. Right. Yeah. But maybe, yeah, I guess. But so now going back to when you were pitching those things, I guess that's probably the reaction that people were having. Yeah, exactly. You, like right? in retrospect, I'm like, oh, I kind of get why they didn't want to buy anything from me because it f- didn't, it felt like I hadn't done the real work. They also, or like were, you were passionate about too many things. Too many, yeah. Yeah. They haven't realized yet that things are broken, right? Like yeah. the disruption is on its way, but it's not really there yet. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But I remember yeah. I used to pitch like, I'm like, and then we'll release it on a Wednesday and I know how to get the thumbnail to be just right. You know, <laughs> <laughs> um, this was when you couldn't choose your own thumbnail. Yeah, I mean, yeah. no, there was an cool. algorithm, right? There was so, an algorithm to choose your thumbnail. That's um, cool. But uh, yeah, but I, I get it yeah. too. Okay. So you, so you didn't sell any TV shows and then what happened? Uh, and economy took the, took, hit the shitter. I'd finished the all for knots. I went and worked on this TV show with David Blaine. So. Was it mesmerizing? <laughs> Do you know all the secrets? I do know all the secrets. You know how to levitate? Uh, no, I do know a lot of the secrets. Ah, I have I'm signed so an NDA. Right now. Is he still doing stuff? It's been a while. Not really. Since After he's hung TV himself show. over in New York. That City. was my special. Oh, oh that's like, fun. I like lived in Central Park for three days. Um, 
so I just went back to traditional television and in the midst of all this stuff, um, I got to know this company, Next New Networks, and their founders, Herb Scannell, Fred Seibert, Tim Shea, Emil Rensing, and Jed Simmons. Like they, We were all like in New York. I always joke, out. it's like oh, everyone was in the same building, right? Because Next yeah. New was like in the same building as Tumblr and Vimeo. Is that right? It's Tumblr and not as Vimeo, but as Boxy. Yeah, yeah. Remember Boxy? And Tumblr, uh, David, uh-huh. was an intern at Next New Networks. Awesome. Perfect. Before yeah. he started Tumblr. So after I did that David Blaine special, uh, Fred and Tim called me and they were like, what are you doing? Yeah. And I was like, I'm really tired. <laughs> and they were, they were like, just come into the office three days a week. Mm-hmm. Wait, can I just sit, make one other observation that I think is really common in this business is that you were like world famous for like a little while and then you just like went back to... Being doing a, a job production coordinator <laughs> yeah yeah which is just cre- so i got a better credit than that on that which is just show. so common though right it's like this thing that people don't realize like the highs are so high and the lows yeah are i felt like such a badass low. and then i was like <laughs> yeah and then someone random will call you and be like what are you doing and then david blaine screamed at me for six months of my life um <laughs> well that's probably why he couldn't hold his breath for I know. Long enough. Get it together, David. <laughs> um, and Fred and Tim were like, just come to the office. And ne- Next New is kind of like an early TV. Like, they had shows, basically, right? So Yeah, they had this idea um, that the internet would be the next cable. Mm-hmm. So, like, Fred and Herb and Jed were all, and Emil. Tim less so. Tim was more, like, internet-y. Mm-hmm. Um, we're all ex-Viacom executives or Turner executives. Right. And they were like, the internet is the next cable. There's going to be hundreds, if not thousands, if not infinite niche channels right. with super dedicated followings. Right. And this is when Netflix was just DVDs in your mailbox. Totally. And they were like, there'll be all these channels and we want to be the Viacom mm-hmm. of that era. And here's the plan. And they got really good at building channels. Like they had this channel, Indie Mogul, that was all about DIY filmmaking, Mm -hmm. Epic Foo, Threadbanger, uh, FLD, which was Fastlane Daily, car thing, and Barely Political, which was the people who made the, uh, I got a crush on Obama. Right. They had that girl, right? That was Obama girl. Pretty. Yeah. Yeah. Amber. Yes. Uh, She was Obama girl. She had a crush on Obama. But she, I mean, that they like kind of like, Invented clickbait. <laughs> totally. <laughs> yes. Ben would not feel great about you saying Ben Rellis, who helped, who started a barely political, would probably not feel sure. great about being well, right. No, not. But it really was about like her cute tits and an Obama t shirt. And right, then right. you clicked on it because it was, was like, cute oh, tits. It's right. funny. And then it was actually good. Right. right. But every success story on the internet is like we're trying to do A and then we accidentally do B and then B takes off. Yeah. You know, right? Yeah. So it's not like you're aiming to be clickbait, but you're realizing. Wait, if we put her in the thumbnail, yeah. people watch this video. The yeah. algorithm did us a favor, and now here we are. Yeah. So next new, you're they, making these shows. Yeah, they brought me on. I started just hanging out and doing shit. Um, and they had just hired the CEO to help them kind of advance the company further. And um, after about nine months of me showing up at the office three days a week and just like helping out on shows mm-hmm. and doing branded content and... He was like, why don't you just run all of production and programming for us? Mm-hmm. And I was like, do you have health insurance? <laughs> sure. So it's this funny mixture of, we're on the forefront of a revolution. We all own our own media. We get to make whatever we want. Television is ours. And also, no one's getting paid. Except for you. You know what I mean? There's a handful of people basically... Doing this. Doing it, yeah. And, and I am conflicted because I'm like, or I could just go back and like be a writer's assistant and mm-hmm. work my way up into a writer's room and do the mm-hmm. thing that is the traditional path. But I'm applying for those jobs while I'm doing this three days a week at next to networks. And I'm not getting them because the producers on the TV shows are like, oh, you made a show for Michael Eisner. You can't be my assistant. Right. Right. Like I can't, they like won't, you should they have taken it off your resume. Yeah. Like they literally yeah. won't give me a job because they're like, this makes no sense. Yeah. You yeah. Like, changed it to cycle Meisner. <laughs> and I was like really frustrated and so and also just, I hadn't been to a doctor in like seven years <laughs> like yeah, my yeah. primary care physician for gangrene. most of my time in New York was the Planned Parenthood yeah yeah like my lady parts did not fall out because of Planned Parenthood thank you shout out shout out to <laughs> yeah. the Planned Parenthood on the Bowery um, 
And uh, so I took it. And um, that was right when they decided to be what's called a multi-channel network. Mm -hmm. MCN. And and MCN. And half my job was like helping all the channels figure out how to produce more efficiently. Mm -hmm. Other half of my job was like branded entertainment pitches. And then the other half of my job because it's a startup, you always have three jobs, was signing channels. Mm-hmm. Like finding Wait, was cool shit Was this pre-maker or post-maker? Or same time same as Maker. Time. Like the Ma- Maker had launched and called themselves The Station. So mm-hmm. this was when Maker was Phil DeFranco, mm-hmm. The Fine yeah. Brothers, Shane Dawson, Shane Dawson and uh, Danny and Lisa. We were just starting to do this stuff. Like we were building this relationship with YouTube and that was the era of the company. And then that was probably around 2009 almost 2010 like late 2009 when I started that job and this whole time I'm like making comedy music videos Mm -hmm. on the side I'm like writing stuff I'm still trying to like hustle my shit and I told them that I was like I'm not going to stop doing this you can't ever make me stop doing this and they were like we don't care why you're being so aggro (laughs) (laughs) like it's fine (laughs) um then they got bought by YouTube yeah in 2011 so you you become a part of YouTube. You are like instrumental in the YouTube space, all of that stuff. And then... Wait, when you say YouTube space, you mean the sound stages? Yeah, the the deal with that is that literally this is the story, is that like the day after the acquisition and like everyone's pumped. I'm like, I don't want to work for Google. Like I literally so YouTube was, was already Google at that yeah, time. Yeah, because I was like, what? Do I, I don't want to work for a big company. And, and you're still in New York at that point, right? right? Yeah. yeah. And so I go into the office the next day. And I have a meeting with Fred Seibert. Many mm-hmm. meetings with Fred Seibert involve people. Wait, why did you not want to work for Google? It's like I because you want to be a writer and director them, and produce. The, the you don't New want York to be Bohemian yeah. lifestyle. That's funny because I, I was yeah. an engineer, and that is like the holy grail of jobs. Like yeah, Apple, but it's Google. still a giant company, and there was no. There was very explicitly at that time, and this gets like a little deep in the weeds. YouTube could not physically produce content because of the um, oh, Digital Millennium owns, Copyright Act oh, yeah, and mm-hmm. Safe Harbor, and so there was very explicitly. We are not buying you to make content. We are buying you to advise other people how to make content on YouTube. Yeah, you guys had a killer uh, deck, basically, that was like best practices. It was was just like, hey, you want to make a web series? Like, this is how you tag your videos smartly. But they defined you as a non-creator. Yeah. Yeah. Which is what bugged you. Yeah. And... And they were like, all nice people. It was people. illegal for you to Yeah, it was like literally a threat to the existence yeah. of the company. And they also probably owned anything you made if you did make something. Yes, but like do they really care about that? No. no. But yes, Google owns everything you make if you are making their right. building with it. If you've ever searched for it, they own it. Yeah. Um, and so I, w- I went into Fred's office and I was like, what am I going to do? And he was like, well, what do you want to do? And I was like, I don't know. He's like, well, you have time here. And they want you to be here, so do what you want to do. And I said, I want them to make it easier for people like me to exist. So m- maybe we build studios all over the world and give them away for free. That was your idea? Yeah. And then I worked with this guy, Liam Collins, who, Collins, who was the COO, and Lance Podell, who was the CEO of Next New, to put, put together the whole plan. It was like my little mini MBA. But at the time, were you like, this is just an insane idea I'm going to suggest? And then they're like, yeah. okay. And then I spent six months building a PowerPoint deck. I didn't know how to do that. And a business model with Liam and Lance. And I went into a meeting and he basically said, build studios in London, Tokyo, Los Angeles, and New York. And I worked with, there's all these internal resources at Google that are like, if they let a producer go too wild, Mm -hmm. she will build four studios. (laughs) Like you (laughs) can find out anything you want. Like I I literally cold called this woman, Terry, and who worked in real estate for Google. And I was like, how? do you think 50,000 square feet would cost in Los Angeles to rent? And she was like, what? And I was like, I just need to do a little research. And like, and, and I just she's a wild. resource for you to like figure that out. Basically everyone at Google is a resource for each other. Yeah. Like that's the ad. And that's the amazing thing about the company. Like if I wanted to cold it's email a, a software engineer, company. I would be like, what about this? Now he may not respond to me sure. or might not Why prioritize you it. He, he's a he or she. Okay. Um, but like that is the attitude is that like, we should all work together and be transparent and be mm-hmm. collaborative. Synergy. And so six months later, I pitched it, and they said yes in the room. And then I spent the next two and a half years building studios in London, Tokyo, and, and figuring out, okay, what does this mean to give away studios for free? Going back sure. to the Safe Harbor and DMCA Act, um, the building of the studios existentially threatened all of YouTube mm-hmm. because we were touching the content. Mm-hmm. Those were their words, not yeah, mine. Sure. Don't touch the content. 
And it was like a whole thing, but they had already said yes to it. So I had to deal with all the legal process and I learned a lot and it was awesome, but it was insane and amazing and also completely, utterly overwhelming and wonderful and crazy that they let me do that. Yeah. It was cool. It's <laughs> Wait, were you pretty... at YouTube when the Fine Brothers made my music, when they were giving a mm-hmm. million dollars to all these different mm-hmm. creators? I, so... Oh, was it my music that I helped them with? There was a, they basically bought Next New Networks because they were like, we just told all these people right. they could have money to make YouTube channels. Yeah, I think of like Amy Poehler, a million dollars. And then they like were random like, random people, right? They brought us into the company and they were like, look at all the things we greenlit. And for like half <laughs> of them, we were like, cool. And for the other half, we were like, what the fuck did you do? This it won't work. Yeah, yeah. Because they didn't know how their own platform worked. Right. Well, they, it seemed like they would give like random celebrities like a million dollars and then they would give. <laughs> People like the Fine Brothers who really knew how to make YouTube videos a million dollars, but they'd say, like, you have to make 300 hours of content. <laughs> they were all, like, pretty crazy content orders at, in that era. Like, yeah. it was all pretty insane. It's just that the Fine Brothers got a million dollars and other people got tens of millions of dollars. Right, because they were... Famous. Same, even though the Fine Brothers had much more viewership on YouTube totally. than Shaq. Yeah. And I was, Next New was part of the reason some of those YouTube talent got funded channels because we were like, mm-hmm. why don't you give some money to the people who've actually built audience? Right. Right. Um, and, my... and George Strompolis actually, like, he mm-hmm. started a program that was the precursor to this before he left for full screen, which Next New Networks was a recipient of. So, like, everyone kind of was pushing for that same right. idea, ultimate agenda. Right. I mean, I feel like the whole story, this is just an epiphany I had right now, of like today's digital episodic like kind of infrastructure is youtubers trying to convince people that they're legitimate <laughs> Tr- trying to convince traditional sure media like, that they're we can legitimate work together filmmakers. sure yeah. yeah and so it's like look we can use sound stages and we can have grips and we can do permits yeah and know? well and the crazy thing is when we opened the studio it was like come and all the youtubers were like uh yeah no yeah i don't trust this now there's like a funny i feel like there's a the new generation of like kids who grew up watching YouTube who are like so excited to go to the space. Like it's like Mecca. I mean, the yeah. space is pretty awesome. I mean, I mean it's, no matter who you are. Cool. Yeah. It's very cool. But I guess what I mean is like, there's a different, it's like you might as well be in the walk of fame. You might as well be in front of Grommets, you know, like there's like yeah. a, a mythology to it now. That's really interesting. Or even me. like my eight year old nephew over the last summer, we had like a little family reunion thing and I wore a, YouTube space baseball cap because mm-hmm. I had worked there. Sure. Yeah, because you're on the YouTube space baseball team. Yeah. And he lost his shit. <laughs> Go playlist. He was like, where'd you get that YouTube hat from? And my sister was like, Reed. You're like, I invented YouTube. <laughs> Reed, she was like, Reed, your aunt used to work for YouTube. And he was like, what? He's like, can you get me one? It was hilarious. <laughs> and great. I was like, yeah, I can get you a YouTube hat. <laughs> <laughs> but I think maybe something to what you're touching on, Matt, is like I, when the YouTube space came out, there was this like, feeling of like what this doesn't make sense yeah. are they gonna own my stuff like this seems too good to be true a little bit you know yeah it was also i had weird moments where like we there was this water.org video that mm-hmm. matt damon made sure yeah i think uh, a andy riz i think shot some of that you, you, oh, really? yeah uh, in the building right when yeah. it first opened and i remember having a conversation with the producer on it being like I was like, you got to sign this location agreement. And he, and like, this is the process. And he was like, well, I don't want to sign it. This clause of it, I want to edit it. And I was like, yeah, here's the deal. Like, there is no negotiating. Yeah. I was like, you sign this and you get to space for free. And he's like, well, I'll pay you for the space so that I can edit it. And I was like, I have no capability of taking money from you. Yeah. So like, just sign, like, Google is not going to ever negotiate this with you because it is not worth their time. Right. And they're not going like, to own oh, anything. There's and, nothing and, and, bad about and it. The, exactly. But they were like so confused by it all. The traditional yeah. people were really confused by it. The YouTubers were like, how do I use a stage? Right. Yeah. We forgot that like, yeah, you can have the space and you have all the equipment for free, but then you need to like production design. Mm-hmm. And yeah. And, and you need costumes, a crew. And you need a crew. And like, we built all this infrastructure to provide that for people, but it still wasn't enough. Still. Yeah. Well, I remember when the Fine Brothers, they did my, they shot my mm-hmm. music there. It was crazy. And I went there and I was like, um, I, someone gave me a tour because, you know, you had to have like a certain number of subscribers or something mm-hmm. to yep. unlock the space or something. Yep. And, um, and they're like, yeah, you can shoot here. And I looked at it and I was just like, I, I, I just couldn't like wrap my mind around like how I would like get all this 
like it was this free space, but you need to bring your crew and you need to yeah, it was hard. have something. Yeah. It's like, it's perfect for if you're already doing that stuff and you need yeah. a space. There yeah. was like faultiness in the premise, but there were no, but also, it's amazing. It's, it was like too, too good to be true. Yeah. And, and that was what I was feeling at the time. I was like, yeah. this is, can't be. They also like I will know. bring like Guillermo del Toro to build a set, yeah. and yeah, then yeah. like anyone can shoot on this like yeah, amazing set. Yeah, it's cool. Set. Like it, it's fun. It is like a weird community to it. Yeah, there was a vibe for a sure. A vibe, and I think it ebbs and flows just like any community. And it's been like, and they've built more since I yeah. left. If, but. if our listeners, you're not if you don't know about YouTube Spaces, you should definitely you should check it out. Check it's it like out. And one like, of the most amazing, like the most socialist of. <laughs> Like internet. from a massively capitalist company. <laughs> sure. Yeah, but it's insane. like, hey, if you want to be a filmmaker and you need whatever you want, like YouTube will give it to in you. like a ten hour slot. You've got it. You know what I mean? Yeah, that was also like. Oh yeah, there's like no after hours or no one that, can get into the building. That was the thing. <laughs> it, this is the thing I always use to illustrate the complication of the YouTube space. Yeah. So like, I would go. I went to unlock the space or whatever. Like after you know, you have a certain number of subscribers in order to like be allowed to use anything. You have to just go through a training thing, which all makes sense. But the very end is the Q and a basically where you kind of just to get to ask questions. And a lot of it's like how to not accidentally infringe on someone's copyright and stuff, you know, kind of yeah. training wheel stuff that makes complete sense. If you're a corporation that needs to train, you know, tons of creators on how to make stuff. But at the end I was like, um, what happens if uh, we hit overtime? You guys haven't talked about that. And they were like, what? And I was like, you know, like... Um, you're running behind. You're behind and you don't get all of the shots that you need. And you need more time. Like after the 10 hours are done. After like when it's time to shut down. Like is there a penalty or a strike system or... How does that work? And they were like, what do you mean? <laughs> and I was like, oh, this is a place run by engineers. It's like I'm asking... What if two plus two didn't equal four? Yeah, and that's they just like, they just never that, you just stop. Like, You're done. That's that it. is the challenge that like that in a nutshell is the like issue with Hollywood and Silicon Valley without a doubt. Yeah. And it's and it's I call it the algorithmics versus the humanists. Mm-hmm. And it's like that is the battle over culture and media and and, and in much more dramatic terms in the last year to two years are our politics. Our algorithms gonna and engineering culture are going to drive how much of that is gonna drive our culture Mm -hmm. and how much of it is gonna be more human Mm -hmm. and and what's the middle ground and then also like I have a lot of I think a lot about like are the algorithms changing us? Well, you should talk to Oren. He knows how to get the algorithm to give you the best thumbnail. Yeah, it's all so. thumbnails, Kathleen. It's all thumbnails. <laughs> There's nothing really beyond sadly it. sadly kind of all My thumbnails. My old boss, sure. Chris Williams, do you know him? Uh-huh. Told me all that matters is the, thumb- is the thumbnail. <laughs> kind of. It's the click. He yeah. And the first 15 seconds. Yeah. We should talk a little bit it's about, sad. New form, right? about new form. Yeah. Too long. Yeah, no, no, no. This it's is only great. been an hour. So only <laughs> your quick stuff. I know. This is. Uh, Wait, I actually don't to... know how where we do the jump from YouTube space to. Did you work for Imagination ever? No, uh, I took Ron on a tour of the YouTube space. Ron Howard. Yeah, I took Ron, this guy Ed Wilson, this guy Jim Wyatt, and uh, Michael Rosenberg, who's the chairman of Imagine. I think he's, that's his title now. Um, on a tour of the YouTube space. Mm-hmm. And I thought nothing of it. I mean, I thought a lot about it. It was fucking sure. cool. It's Ron Howard. Super neat. Yeah. yeah super and neat. Imagination yeah. is Ron Howard's production. Imagine. Movie, who's made, imagine, who's yeah. made movies like Cowboys and Aliens. Come on. They have <laughs> Apollo 13. Yeah. Beautiful mind. Uh, yeah. nut- nutty professor. B- basically, <laughs> but like every Big like. Big, and Ron Arrested Howard's. Development. Sure, yeah. uh, Empire. Like Eight Mile. Yeah, yeah. When you start actually, it's, you're like. There's a you're bunch like, of really awesome shit, and there's also a bunch of stuff that you're like, Nutty Professor? Why yeah, did you do that? Oh, okay. Or like, awesome. The Grinch Who Stole Christmas? You Have get, you watched that recently? Well, Does not. I actually it did not see it. Ooh, um, but, you know, <laughs> listen, you got to keep the lights on, right? Yeah, the, and also Those like, offices are very nice, right? They are. They have new offices, too, that oh, are okay, lovely. I took them on a tour. I basically called my mom that night and was like, I met Ron Howard. Yay. Um, I had already kind of mentally decided I wanted to Was leave your mom me. like, can you give me that $5,000 back? <laughs> I eventually paid them back when I got bought by YouTube. <laughs> okay. like, they were really grateful about that. And yeah. honestly, once I got a job at YouTube, they were just that's like, that's all they could tell people. And they would never tell people YouTube. They'd always be like Google. Google. Yeah. yeah, sure. Yeah. And I'd always be like, well, I work at YouTube. And they'd be like, 
people would be like kind of disappointed and I'd be like, it's owned by Google. It's right. fine. I still have the Google And stock. your parents were like, but can you get a job at Yahoo? <laughs> <laughs> um, I thought nothing of it. I, and I like didn't think anything would come of it other than like a good story about me and Ron Howard. I had already decided I wanted to leave YouTube. I literally had a countdown clock on on my phone. For Wait, can I ask you a side question? At this this whole time that you were at Next New and then YouTube, were you directing or writing or doing any of that? I stuff? was writing a lot more than I was directing because it's a hell of a lot easier to make time for writing. Uh, I was directing these uh, a couple uh, sketch comedy video stuff. I directed a pilot for a New York Television Festival. Oh, cool! I did a bunch of stuff. Like I did anything I. Could make enough time for like you were still into episodic comedy stuff was your thing yeah although like increasingly i'm like not uh, i'm interested in that but i'm doing other stuff like lately i've been writing different stuff than that i wrote a a drama pilot this year and you've done music stuff too obviously yeah well although i'm not musical i just like the world of music Mm -hmm. like i would not i can't really carry a tune or really have any rhythm um but i'm interested in that area and i was i liked making music videos Mm -hmm. because they're fun to make yeah um I met Ron. I was planning on leaving YouTube. I literally was like going to give notice no matter what. And the plan was to like go to Argentina for three months and learn the tango. Oh, that sounds good. I want to know about your countdown clock actually on your phone. Mm -hmm. So you, like you said, you know what? I'm going to quit in X number of days and you set a timer. Uh, My first day of YouTube, I set a timer. I said I'd stay for three years and leave no matter what. Gotcha. Wow. That's a long timer. (laughs) Yeah, it was, but it was like. you have to keep your phone that whole time? It's an app. Like I would just restart it if I got a new phone. And just with the idea that like I'm going to do as much as I can in these three years. Mm -hmm. And if I stay any longer, I might turn into a Google executive, which is not what I wanted. And and I would say like a year before the end, I took a lot of thought into like taking a moment to be like, or I could stay here. Mm Mm-hmm. And, like, there's a lot of really cool things about Google. Like, I could have stayed there and decided that I wanted to work in, like, driverless cars and move to London or Tokyo and, like, incredible place to work in that respect. And that was very seductive, but not more seductive and interesting to me than making things. Sure. Yeah, you can pay for your own coffee and lunch. Wait, so you could have been a Google map car driver? You, you, can, you can literally be like, that's the great thing about a company like that. And I don't think Google is alone in this. Is like, if you're in a big enough company like that, you can decide like, YouTube has been great. I want to go move laterally to this new tool because mm-hmm. I'm more interested in that. Or I want to move laterally because I want to go live in Buenos Aires. Right. And Google and like, is famous for encouraging that. Like Gmail totally. came out of like someone... Yeah. That just like randomly was like, oh, well, even like a a better email. My last year at YouTube or so, this woman, Diana, came to work in our group. Um, And for prior to working in our group, she worked directly for Marissa, a mayor for seven years, and then decided that she wanted to be more in media and Mm -hmm. ultimately a screenwriter. And we literally got a phone call from Eric Schmidt being like, the you CEO have a new, to Google. At, of Google at the time. The Michael Eisner of Google. <laughs> exactly. And he was like, you now have an extra head. We're like, what? And that's a big deal to get an extra head, extra head, sure. head count. Right. And we we're like, why? And they're like, because Diana Lee wants to move to LA and ex- explore what it means to work in media. And we were like, who? And, and she ended up being an incredible asset to mm-hmm. our team and is a, so brilliant. But it was like literally from on high. They were like, this person wants to explore and Boop. see what their next phase is. Yeah. Boop. Here's an extra resource. And she was a total badass and is a, a wonderful uh, person and an amazing, increasingly amazing writer and like really cool. Like, But that's the kind of people who work right. at Google. Like, right. I will never work anywhere with anyone smarter or nicer than the people I worked with at Google. Right. Like it's kind of insane. Anyways, I, I had this countdown clock. Yeah. And then uh, about six months after that tour, I got a, I was on a hike with a friend of mine who worked at CAA, mm-hmm. uh, Sarah Pass. She now works at Amazon. Um and she was like, your name came out of a meeting today. This is also what TA is good at agents. They're good at yeah. infor- information. It's an awesome name for an agent, by the way. Sarah Pass? Yeah. yeah. Right? Like, yeah. Uh, we, we've got a pass. Yeah. <laughs> on the line. On the line. <laughs> no. She wants to talk to you. Um, yeah. And she pass. was like, your name came out of the meeting today. Ron, Howard, and Brian Grazer want you to run this company for them. That is so crazy, though. Off of a tour. I don't Wait, know. What did you say? A tour, tour and a resume. Right. No, they like, had never seen my resume. But you know, you I mean, sure CA was yeah, like, yeah. "She's amazing," or yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah exactly. And like, you know, but yeah. did they know about the Berg or any of that stuff? No, 
they just knew that I was like a good executive, I think. I don't know. They had to have like asked around though. Like no one just says like, hey, we want you to run a brand new company without due diligence. Certainly not them, right? You're not, there's no, not someone more steeped in traditional media than him. For him, probably like the digital world was probably like, yeah, giving sure. tours is probably most of the work. <laughs> I, there was probably a certain element of like, we don't know anything about this world. This person seems to know a lot about it, but we right. also, and she CAA seems creative. Up, obviously. Mm-hmm. And also I wasn't the only candidate. I then went through sure. like a three to six month process. And right. I think what won them over is that I kept saying, this is what I want to do. If you guys don't want to do this, like, this is what I think I would do if I was running the company. If you don't want to do that, no harm, no foul. Tell me what you want to do. I will find the person who can right. do it for you because right. you will never you know meet anyone yeah, yeah. who knows more people in digital media right. than this mm-hmm. woman. That's a good pitch. I should use that in, like, regular pitches. Like, this is the way I want to do the show. If you guys don't want to do it this way, then I'll recommend someone else. But this is the way I want to do the show. And then It's a strong you. position. Yeah. You have to be willing to Even if to they're walk agreeing away. with you the whole time. <laughs> 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 I think you, um, you know, and then after that whole process, we... St- Started the company. It was really, uh, and that yeah. company was Newform. And that Digital. company was Newform, and our mission. And was where did to, the name come from? They had it. I did actually use, was there a form digital. Uh, the, it, well, yeah, it was originally the new form digital. Yeah, right? and then and I the, dropped the digital yeah, after yeah. like eighteen months. Yeah, and we sold a TV show. Um, NFD, right? And if we'd often call it NFT, uh, I didn't like the name. In fact, I did last right before we announced the company, I did a last minute huge pitch to be like. Here are 16 names I come up. I've cleared them all. Yeah. I own the L. I own Kathleen the domain. Grace Digital, K Grace Digital, <laughs> Kathleen G Digital. Um, but ultimately, uh, I think it kind of ended up working. For our listeners that don't know what New Form is, what is New Form? Uh, we are a digital studio uh, developing mobile first content for the next generation. So it's it's really all about emerging voices and formats. Has that always been? Is it always been mobile first? Or? Yeah, that feels like. Uh, it's new, probably in the new last like, two and a half, three years. That's how I, it's my like way of saying it because I think it, the reason I think about it mobile first is like in, it's not short form. It's mm-hmm. anything you discover and consume initially on your for, on your phone. Mm-hmm. And that can be long form. And this audience finds everything and consumes everything on their phone, even if it's right. Netflix, even right. if it's YouTube. final space on TBS. So in a sense, saying mobile first just means media. Yeah. It, yeah. Interesting. But it's different than... It um, means we're not afraid of vertical video, folks. <laughs> well, yeah, and I'm not afraid of like social platforms. And yeah. I understand how people consume and find content. And that actually fundamentally, in my opinion, affects how you develop. Mm-hmm. Because if you have no guaranteed audience, there's no lead-in audience in digital. Right, right. And there's no lead-in audience on Netflix. Sure. Like, Even though the whole idea of like an MCN is to be a lead-in, is to create lead all in, these lead-ins. Lead-in right? audience. You have to develop differently, mm-hmm. and the whole creative process is different. And you How have, so? Um, I think you have to. Uh, you always have to think about marketing on traditional television, but in a way, you have to think about it way earlier in the process mm-hmm. if you want to have a successful show in this day and age. Mm-hmm. And it's not just because it's on your phone; it's because there's like audiences are incredibly fragmented, mm-hmm. and so. You have to kind of already know your audience before you have made the show or even thought of the log line mm-hmm. and or do the you think, I'm curious if that's like evolved. Like when we did Miss 2059, like uh, three years ago now, yeah. I know because my daughter is three years old oh my God. as of last week. Like at, at that time, casting was like a big element of oh sure yeah like, of getting yeah. people to watch your show like if we get this person that has two million subscribers that's what we all thought i mean i guess in my mind it was like well she's a makeup vlogger like she's not an actress right wouldn't we rather get like a good actress, actress. um but what's what's kind of the current strategy the stuff that you see is working i think it's the stuff that is there is something very timely hooky and relevant about the world that is easy to talk about and shareable and so i don't think it's necessarily cast a huge actress although i think um when you're thinking about marketing and standing out it helps and i don't necessarily think that means as a social media person it could be sandra bullock in the box you know like bird box um because she's relevant to a certain audience but it has to be easy to talk about it has to have a kind of a core audience you know you're gunning for uh and then malleable in the sense that they can people can like take this idea and make it their own. Like, like the bird box thing is a really Mm -hmm. weird example, but good. Like Netflix had this instinct, I'm sure backed up by data that like people are really into apocalypse stories. Mm -hmm. And then they also know that people really love Sandra Bullock. 
and then they also can unknowingly unleash this thing, which is like, oh, there's this very simple visual kind of meme thing about mm-hmm. the premise, mm-hmm. which is there's this box and you're blind, or, you know, like... Right, or, and, like a quiet place, but with... Vision, exactly. Like, and, and there was something very simple and easily transmitted through social media and word of mouth that helped that kind of be. And they also featured it on the freaking homepage for like sure. a month. But yeah. Let me ask but, you this. Do you think that that all those things you just said about what makes a show catch on now, does do they not all apply to traditional media nowadays also? I, th- I I guess I think increasingly they do apply to traditional media. And that's why I'm like, that's why I say mobile first because it's, and social first is it's like, that is media. And if you're not doing that on TV, your TV show is not getting ratings either, but it's your TV show is also not getting ratings because of the technology, meaning right. like people don't watch TV. Like, right. I guess what you anymore. said earlier maybe is that in TV, people find your show in a different way, mm-hmm. right? The famous like George Costanza line is like, why are people going to watch our show? Because it's on TV. Yeah. Right. Um, and on the internet, that's not the case. No. You, it's BYOA. Bring your own audience. BYOA. Yeah. For everything. And yes. like, and that's even for like, that's the, I think the really frustrating part, I think for everyone in media right now is like, even if you're Will Smith. Sure. Like, you're not guaranteed an audience is going to show up to watch you jump out of a plane on YouTube. Yeah. But I bet if you're Sam Smith, they would watch it. <laughs> um, so we've had this debate a lot on the podcast of like how important as a filmmaker uh, bringing your mm-hmm. BYOAing is. Right. Like if you want to make a feature film, how much do you need to bring your own audience? Because it, we've heard definitely both versions. Like all you have to think about is uh, is bring your audience. Who was um, Seed and Spark? You know, do you know? Yeah. Sure, Emily they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So well, big. That's their jam. Right. Sure. And then there's like the guys from Short of the Week that are like no, just make something amazing and like, don't worry about anything else. Um, so what's your, I mean, obviously they're both right. It's a certain degree. Yeah. I think they're both right to a certain degree. I think that filmmakers have to get used to the idea that, uh, it's a lot harder to be like a isolated auteur version Mm -hmm. of a filmmaker now. And I think that's okay because isn't the point to be in conversation with the world. Right. Um, not everyone has to be a like rabid marketer though, because, that's exhausting. Anyway. Yeah, that's the tricky part. And like, right? if you spend too much time on that, the story might not be good. Yeah. I, I, my pitch is always like, find the things that you're excited about talking about and doing in addition to telling the story and hopefully find a partner who is like really interested in helping mm-hmm. you find audience yeah. and like think that through. I think about with Squaresville, like I shot and finished that entire first season and then basically spent the same amount of time marketing it every more. I stopped writing and started like, yeah. Hanging out on whatever. tweeting, yeah, yeah, exactly. Like signing up for you know, but do you think real SEO newsletters or whatever? <laughs> do you think that show did well because you were lucky that it found that an audience existed, or do you think you were like, there's an audience for this? I know, I, I, I 100% knew that there was space on the board. Like at the time, people were not making like s- premium scripted content of for like young, smart, bookish women, basically, yeah, book like, girls, yeah. Like, like nerd girls did not exist. I literally like drew a picture of like. You were the, going to Tumblr and typed nerdy girls. And I, nothing came up. <laughs> nothing came up. I, I, but like Tumblr was like a big part of the whole, mm-hmm. the whole marketing campaign. And like it also spending time on that site helped me refine what it was that like the language that they spoke. You know what I mean? Like right. they we, ship, I, they ship people. Yeah, exactly. Like shit. building like gifts and things like that wasn't something that natively occurred to me you know um but engaging with a fan base literally every single day for two years basically is what helped make that show successful so it was both the opportunity like knowing that there was an audience out there that was hungry for it but also relating to them on their terms yeah i think the the biggest advice i give to people when thinking about the internet uh and how to create content for it is like the internet's a really cool house party follow the rules of the house party when you go to a house you bring something cool like something tasty to drink or eat yeah you talk about things other than yourself and you engage in a conversation you don't shout at people right Mm -hmm. and you lie to your parents about where you're at totally (laughs) so like that is the rules like yeah bring something cool talk about other things 
and don't shout at people. Because that's mm-hmm. the thing I think people mess up is the third thing is they're like, sure. well, if I just shout enough about my show, people sure. will watch it. And you're like, no, 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 no. Like, in, like what you did, engage mm-hmm. with them in their own. You were coming to their party. Right. And identify the right party. And so are you saying like YouTube is a party? Yeah, it's all a party. The whole internet is a party. I mean, YouTube's sometimes a pretty terrible party, depending on what parts of YouTube you're in. Um, but like YouTube's a party, but even like, how you should build audience and mm-hmm. con- converse and think about content in the space of social media is like, don't, I think it's really hard to be a filmmaker now who only wants to make stuff for yourself. Mm-hmm. Like, or, or maybe that's a myth. Maybe those filmmakers don't exist, but there was this myth of like, I'm going to make I'm just, I just make myself laugh. Yeah. Or yeah, like, yeah. I'm just making things I'm interested in. And I'm like, cool. You could also just be experimental video artists and do right. that too. And there's um, a difference. Right. I, oh, I think also there's, it's easy to confuse specificity for self-indulgence right yes and so like envision envision right sure yeah um so making a thing that is special and unique because it's specific in a a different way is more relatable to everyone you know what i mean Mm -hmm. when you go broad no one can relate to anything right um but that doesn't mean that sometimes you still have to pull your head out of your ass right yeah yeah I mean that. Yeah, it's basically like listen to notes, <laughs> right? Be collaborative. Yeah, yeah, sure. Listen to notes, or yeah. or give yourself hard notes. Yeah, yeah. But because that's I think the hardest part when you're in this like early stage mm-hmm. is like how do you know it's good? I mean, we really lucked out on the Berg in some ways. Like Matt and Tom had this really specific interest. Like we were a good balancing foil to each other, the three of us. But you were also like immersed in a world, and, it and was, you didn't overthink it, yeah. right? You just made a show about it. Yeah. The crazy thing about going back and looking at old episodes of The Berg is like all the shit that we use to make fun of that neighborhood has come true. Oh, sure. Yeah. Like in a really eerie way. Like stuff that we were like, this would never happen, happens. Right. Like now. you're exaggerating things and then they It happened. True. It all happened. Um, well, so where where are you guys? What what are you doing today? Did, did you guys just get sold? We sold the, I sold the company. In like a good, like that sounds yeah. weird, but it's a good thing. You're not like, my investors goodbye, are everyone. happy. My you didn't take it to happy. a pawn shop. Yeah. Like. <laughs> um, Who did they, you sell it to? It, this company, Whistle. They are a, a kind of digital media studio, mostly focused on creating content for young men and around sports. But they have really built up a capability around building social audiences and short form platforms and branded content. And they had a little bit of like non-scripted stuff that like went, they got good at selling to other people. They sold some shows to Go90. Um, They have a show with Quibi that they're in production with now. But they hadn't really cracked how to take social content and talent and sell it to traditional buyers. And they hadn't cracked Mm -hmm. scripted or kind of more premium content. The Um, stuff New Form did. The stuff we do. And so we were additive to them in that. And they were additive in the sense that now I have this audience of lots of young men that I can make content for and we can sell something to TBS or whoever and say, and we bring all this promotional strength through their network or we can sell branded content. You know, like there's a lot more opportunities there. And so we just did that. Like I just closed that deal a little over six weeks ago. So we're in the midst of figuring out how we all work sure. together. Oh, like new Form's still getting to do all the new formy stuff. Like we have, we just announced, um, our series, I Ship It, is going to be on airing. CW. Yeah. Um, we have uh, some other exciting stuff going on. We have a uh, unannounced show with Quibi that we're heading into production on, which is exciting. That's exciting. It's, and a lot of it's the, like the stuff we like to make, which is like a little female skewing, a little like genre hybrid, mm-hmm. fun weirdo stuff that doesn't fit in boxes, new forms, and. We also have this thing, text stories, that's been, oh, yeah, yeah. like scripted uh, shorts that are people texting with each mm-hmm. other. So now we have one, two, three pages of that. There's like the main page and now we have a horror one mm-hmm. and uh, why am I always, and then like a thriller and then like a, this thing called Text University, which is how we, uh, is more experimental in how we train all of our writers. So we have a whole group of writers that write all of those and it's really fun oh that's awesome oh it's totally like in some ways that's the most interesting thing about my job right now is tech stories and then also we Which have two zero series live Snapchat. action no there's no oh there's little we're now integrating little bits of live action to see oh, into the tech mm-hmm. stories oh, how it works like that's people fun. facetiming people sending gifts mm-hmm. to each other like slowly seeding how you could potentially tell a big bigger story in this have you seen those experiences where like you put your phone number into something 
like and you can go to like a place and they'll be like give us your put your phone number into this system and then you get a facetime call and they're like help me i'm stuck in this place and oh, you're really? like really like some this. it's like a arg type yeah. of thing i don't know it seems cool but it that reminded me of it um, it is a little like there is potential to do that and what would that look like and mm-hmm. how would you tell a good story that's all the, the all the stuff with like ARGs and VR and all that like sure. in, choose your own adventure. It's all neat, but like, is what's it a satisfying the narrative? Yeah. Narrative. Yeah. yeah. What's your take experience? on Echo? Is that something you can say out we loud? We did a couple of pilots with Echo um, really early on last year when they were still like finessing the product. Sure. You know, I want to go back actually and touch on something that you mentioned just in explaining new form actually. You said uh, that you're focused on breaking new voices. Yeah. What does that mean to you? I really, I, I don't know if this is the best strategic decision for the company. I like working with young people. Mm-hmm. And I think it's, well, while also like, who the fuck am I? It's way easier for me to get a younger, less experienced sure. writer to do something with us or find a really interesting, unique voice and work with them and then attach more traditional established people to right. help bring it to life develop it basically yeah. and then kind of flesh it out and I, so like that can be a youtube person sure uh, it, early on in our genesis it was but also like right now i'm working with this uh female uh writer and director Janie feingold mm-hmm. who did a series last year for brat and now we have a series in development with her and she's probably like 26 mm-hmm. and like for snap it's a series for snap so like i don't need to attach big talent there right, right. but i have we have a project that we piloted a couple years ago that I, we just attached Mila Kunis to. Oh, wow. We're that's taking exciting. out. Yeah. And like that stuff is really fun for me. Yeah. And I like, pair, like, and Final Space is the perfect example of this. Like, mm-hmm. Olin is not literally young. I mean, he obviously is like an adult human, but he was an untested voice for mm-hmm. animated comedy. He'd never made an animated comedy. He wanted You're breaking to... talent regardless yeah, of. Yeah, yeah, I like that. It's fun. Yeah. And it's also really, and, and it's not just because I get to break them. Mm-hmm. It's also because like, Finding David Sachs for Olin was like a very, and Matt Hawk, who's my VP of development, gets 150% credit for all of that. The only thing I did was say yes and get out of the way on Final Space. Like, <laughs> sure. and he was the one who like really thoughtfully paired David with Olin, and like they got along. And they and David is a wonderful human and like amazing at making Final Space what it is with Olin. But that's an art, mm-hmm. like. Sure. Pairing people yeah, up. Yeah, matchmaking. And matchmaking sure. them. And I love it. Yeah. Because it's, it's very fun to watch people learn how to work together. It's also a little scary sometimes because sometimes you pair people and it doesn't work. <laughs> sure. And it's like, oh, sorry. So I, I'm sure listeners at home are like, hey, I'm young. I haven't been <laughs> broken yet. Yeah. <laughs> How do I get my new form meeting? Right, like how, like say, or, or uh, even like what is new form looking for? Right? What is yeah, exactly. Like how can how can someone I mean, sell very you a show? Particularly right now, male skewing sports stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Got to sure. fill the pipe with that. Yeah. Um, sure, but uh, you guys don't do podcasts, do you? We're uh, uh, in the sense that we are thinking about using it as a way to test IP and pilot stuff. Yes. I don't know if I'll build out like a podcast infrastructure. The best thing you can do to get on our radar, one, we take a lot of meetings from agencies because that's just Mm -hmm. how the business works, but is make stuff, Mm -hmm. send it to us via the tweets. Like, um, and that can be me, KM Grace Mm -hmm. uh, on Twitter or new form. And just be aware of us. And, like, I'm pretty accessible. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, and that's part of who I am because you never know. Like, I have a real you never know idea or attitude about this stuff. And then specifically, if you are young and just want to get really good at writing text stories, which actually I think is a really good way to get good mm-hmm. at writing dialogue but also escalating your stakes in a really interesting like you learn a lot about like setting up Mm -hmm. to hook and say and escalating your stakes very very quickly you should be a tech story writer and like we are always looking for those right now how does one become one one. i don't know i don't like like, send you a spec text uh, uh, specs there isn't like an open email but Mm -hmm. i will do you spec if you tweet new form i'll figure out how to get you into the right hands yeah. they don't have a like open process yet like right now it's like a lot of us going to film schools like asking going around. asking yeah. around so there isn't like a clear like you also could just message on facebook text stories txt stories now what, what if, would it take you if someone does do that and ends up writing text stories you have to tweet to us because that would make my day yeah, yeah. 
And feel when you go to these film schools, feel free to tell them about our podcasts. You know. I will. <laughs> well, awesome. Well, we have so much good stuff. I feel like we could talk to you for like another seven hours. Thanks for chatting with us. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for coming. having me. Yeah. Um, if people want to learn more about what New Form is doing and what you're doing, Twitter is the name of the game. Mm, or, or like. Uh, so they yeah. go to the Berg website. Oh my god, it doesn't <laughs> the exist. Berg. Dot com. I think it rolls over to that a YouTube page that I don't manage. Oh, Although great. when I was at YouTube, I got really obsessed with it and redid all the thumbnails, <laughs> which says a lot about my personality. <laughs> <Sure. Sure. laughs> Telling you, it's all one. about the thumbnails. It is. Um, and your KM Grace. Twitter. Yeah. KM Grace. KM Perfect. Grace. Awesome. Okay. Um, cool. So do you know about unpaid endorsements? Unpaid endorsements. Okay, guys, really dumb endorsement. Coming up. Ooh. Um, so you know Saran Wrap? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just got this new type. It's called Press and Seal. Have you ever used mm-hmm. that one? I've never used it, but I know what it is. No. Yeah. We never buy it because it's like a dollar more than like the regular Saran Wrap. But I accidentally bought it because I was like, I don't know. My wife asked me to buy like decorative stuff. <laughs> and they had one with like ornaments on it. Or I don't know. There's some dumb reason why I bought it. And it's like amazing. It sticks to anything. And it's like, it's sticky on one side. So like, you know, I don't know. Do you ever like put saran wrap on an avocado? <laughs> like you eat half an avocado and you're like sure. trying to save the second half. But then like the saran wrap doesn't stick and yeah, nothing, yeah. you know, everything. And it all goes Saran wrap's yeah. always like falling off everything. But check out this press and stick saran wrap. It's kind of, kind of amazing. Kathleen, you got anything? Uh, so I read this novel over Christmas. It's called Cherry mm-hmm. by Nico Walker. It's awesome. Like and the fruit. C-H-E-R-R-Y. Yes, cherry, like the fruit. I read the whole thing not knowing the backstory of the author. Mm-hmm. And I don't, part of my joy of reading it is that I didn't know the backstory, but I would tell you guys all of it. So it's the story of a Iraq war veteran who is a drug addict and robs banks to fund his habit. Mm-hmm. It's dark. This is not an uplifting sure. book. Yeah. So I read the whole thing in like five days. And, and in fact, I, like the last night when I finished it, I uh, said to my boyfriend, I was like, I'm not going to sleep till I finish this book because it's so unrelentingly dark. Mm -hmm. But it's such a specific, amazing voice. It's like all told in his voice and his point of view. So you get to the last page of the book, you turn, and you realize that Nico Walker is currently serving time in jail. And the backstory is this guy is... This book is a fictionalized account of his actual... Pretty much his life. Mm -hmm. And he wrote the book five pages by five pages on a typewriter... Or with a pencil, I think, in jail. Wow. With his editor. He would mail them the pages. They would then have a phone, his call, mm-hmm. like his weekly call or whatever. Right. Yeah. Um, I've never been to prison. Um, he Lame. would get all the notes over the phone, but couldn't write them down. Right. Because right. you're not allowed to have a pencil. He'd have to <laughs> remember all those notes, go back to his cell, retype and rewrite those pages, implement the notes, and send them back. And he did that for the whole novel. He is still currently serving time. And when I read that, I was like, Whoa, wow. I have no fucking excuse to yeah. get off my ass and make something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, like, yeah, a, he has a lot of time in the world because he's in prison. Yeah, but yeah, like, sure. that is really hard. Boy, it's oh, like boy. a million little pieces meets the diving bell and the butterfly. Yeah. And, and it was really well written and really a good read and kind of extraordinarily interesting. Dark. But it, then when you read that, you're like, oh my you're God, like, this guy's well, brilliant. This is his first novel. Yeah. But really the most controversial thing I'll... I've ever said is aren't you kind of jealous of someone that's just like in a cell all day and they're just working on their novel <laughs> yeah, just like, totally yeah. like there was a moment where I was like super impressed and then I was like maybe I should go to jail yeah. <laughs> well you know you've inspired me uh, I watched all of Escape from Danamora super fast have you guys watched that show not yet it's no, great someone endorsed it on uh, did I already endorse right? it no it, somebody else did no Someone a lot of people in it. my life have been endorsing it, so it's pretty darn good. It's pretty yeah. endorsable. Yeah. In case I ever have already endorsed it, Escape from Danamore is still great. Um, it's like real pulpy. It's pretty fun. It's very well directed. Ben Stiller, who is it? Netflix, uh, Showtime. Oh, Showtime. Showtime. That's but why. If you've got Amazon Prime, you can get it done in uh, the trial period pretty easily. Like it's it's that good. It, they're on the longer side, so you have to commit to it. But wait, so you can watch Showtime through Amazon Prime? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's an add-on. Mm-hmm. Oh wow, it's, it's a pretty awesome. And then I watch Showtime through Hulu, but yeah, yes, yeah, same thing. Yeah, yeah. My other one is a different streaming service. Um, 
but Dropout, actually, the College Humor streaming service is pretty great. Um, but especially, I love the show called Total Forgiveness, which is about Allie and Grant, two staff writer performers there on the show, or on you know at the site, who both have a terrible student debt. They have insane student debt. And it's a challenge show between the two of them where they basically trade terrible dares back and forth and then the company gives them large sums of money to help pay off their student debt so at the end of the show they may they it's possible to win like up to like fifty thousand dollars out of their debt so it's like serious money wait if they do the dare then they get the money if they do the dare they get the money but if the other person fails the dare they get their money too Oh, so, so they're both there at the same to thing. be re- no 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 they're creating the dares for each other so it's like grant is creating a challenge for Allie that if she fails he gets her money and also if he succeeds in his challenge gets his money but what's the can he make anything can he say jump off a five-story building well you know there's still human beings and things and like standards that. and practices yeah yeah but, yeah, but, but, but is like, it a challenge that like he himself has to do also like no, that's what would no no, they're, they're tailor-made to each other. So, for instance, in the second episode, Grant has to wear a shock collar like a dog would wear all day at work. It's very funny. And it and it, somebody presses a button. No, and no, so no. He, it's, he doesn't it's purely, get shocked? If he talks. <laughs> oh. No, because it's shocked. a bark Yeah, it's like a bark, bark oh, yeah. shock collar. Yeah, yeah. For Which, instance, by the way, I unendorse this. <laughs> <laughs> Matt doesn't own a dog. I don't own a dog. My dog has brought me so much joy. I don't yeah. mind a little barking too. That's okay. Thank you. Neither do our listeners. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, cool. Anyway, well, that so drop. How do you watch the drop the college? Yeah, again, stuff? you can sign up for um, a, a free, free trial. Free trial. Dropout dot com. I'm paying for it though. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's an app. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. There's an app for that. And total forgiveness in particular, which you can watch the pilot episode. The entire 22 minute episode is on YouTube. Which cool. 22 minutes, that's cool. Yeah, they're going for it. It's so, crazy. So 2017, 22 minutes. <laughs> I like my pilots 30 minutes now. I like it. What, what, someone told me that Netflix is calling them sub-22s. Ugh, they're gross. Buying, they're that buying is... sub-22s. Gross. Well, awesome. uh, yeah, thanks, thanks, guys. Thanks, thanks, thanks for so being much. on the podcast. Yeah. If you guys want to um, ask us more questions, give us comments, tell us what you think about Kathleen Grace, uh, email us at justshootitpod at gmail.com. You can find all the show notes at justshootedpod.com. I'm at Mr. Madinlow on all social media. I'm at Smitey Pileg on Twitter and Oren Kaplan. O. Kaplan. <laughs> and O. Kaplan on Instagram. Um, this episode was edited by Jay McAuliffe. It was produced by Madeline Rosewatt. The Our webmaster is Ewan Williams. And the music you're listening to right now is from the Free Music Archive and the artist Jazard. And we will see you later. That's it. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye.